A few months ago, I posted this. Now I want you to tell us what you think we should investigate next. Fill in the blanks. It could be and this is what I got the most requests for. So in this episode of Talking Point, it's all about this spicy and numbing dish. Mala. You know what? I'm actually not a fan of mala. Water, please. But because you guys asked for it, I'm gonna dig in, keep on eating to find out exactly what is in this dish. Why are people so hooked on it? I think it really stimulates all of my senses. It's super sure. Mm, it's a very comforting thing to have when it's raining. When I crave it, uh, I'll come for this. Clearly, these people that I've met are crazy over Mala. But do you want to know how it all started? Well, I'm meeting the man who's created a Mala empire. Back in 2014, after years of working as a mala chef, Yang Tian saw the opportunity to open his own store. That grew into seven outlets island-wide, selling all things mala. Look at all the different kinds of chilli. Oh wow, I never knew so many different things went into just the sauce. Xuan, Yang Chong. So, you use Okay. Most would think mala came from the Chongqing and Sichuan region in China, but in fact its origins are still undetermined. Some say it was conjured up by a Chongqing chef during his trip to Beijing, while others say it originated in northern China where Beijing, Tianjin and Hebei are. As for which of the many mala dishes is the original, many reckon it's the hot pot. Uh Mala is no longer just limited to hot pot, grilled fish, and the stir-fried version, or what we better know as mala xiangguo. It's now spicing up other types of food. And there are now even mala snacks as well. Ooh, mala chips, mala fish skin, mala peanuts, even mala pizza, mala noodles, and mala burger. And oh, wait, wait. Don't throw the chicken rice. That's right, mala chicken rice. I can't help but wonder, what exactly is our love for mala doing to our health? To find out, I'm putting the most common mala dishes under the microscope. The stir-fried version and the hot pot. And to narrow down which ones to test, I need to pick your brains to find out what are the most popular mala hotspots in Singapore. I've engaged the help of those in the know, food bloggers. Some stores can be super spicy, but no numbing sensation at all. It has to have a lot of other complex flavors in it. It's not just you and the dish, but the whole atmosphere of getting clustered together, the heat, the smokiness from the hawker center. Broth is the key part here because you are drinking it, it can't be too heavy. Based on the brands with the best reviews, we managed to narrow down the top three stir-fry mala and mala hotpot. 
I'm testing them for sodium and fat levels. They are cooked in the same set of popular ingredients. Leafy vegetables, meat, seafood paste, bean curd and noodles. We can test the baby for the fat content and also sodium. Look at the amount of oil that is sticking to yes. the spoon already. Something else I'm curious about, whether the level of spice makes a difference to how unhealthy your mala dish is. As I wait for the results, I'm taking a closer look at the ingredients that make mala so addictive. A mala craze has ignited in Singapore, burning bellies and also a hole in our wallets. That's because a single serving of stir-fried version could easily reach 10 Singapore dollars. And a mala hot pot meal, up to 60 Singapore dollars. I asked mala chefs to explain the high price point. There's more meat and more seafood, so naturally the cost will be higher. We use our 20 over herbs to make this sauce suitable for Singaporean taste. If it's going to hit my pocket, I want it to at least be worth the pain. Since Mala Hot Pot has the widest price range, I figure I'll go try the two extremes to see which is more worth it. First up, Shili Fang. The first thing you'll notice at any of its 15 outlets would be the soft toys hanging all over its storefront. But behind all that fluff is one of the cheapest mala hot pots in Singapore. Oh, hi. Oh, here we are. Okay. I'm starving. And because eating mala hot pot is a social event, I asked radio DJ and mala fanatic Jermaine Tan to join me. Mala soup, one chili buddy, two chili buddy, oh. or three chili buddies. I'll go for the three. Let's okay. bring it on. I'm just going to throw it all, all right. in. Cut it, just let it go in. Right, okay. right. Wow. Wow. That is spicy. Wow. Shio, it's oh. really good. It's so fragrant, no? Now the first sip yep. kind of had a kick, but now now that I've, you know it's not as bad. Look at the amount of things in this broth. For this spread, we had to fork out about twenty-five Singapore dollars per person, but the lunch value meal can go for as low as eight eighty Singapore dollars per pax. Our next stop, Tongsing Rui. It's one of the newest kids on the block, but also one of the priciest. This okay. one is with catfish. I think we can get Ooh, this. catfish. Wow, oh, look at this. Spicy, Spicy BQ. BQ. Well, this looks interesting. Ooh. It smells I can good, smell right? it immediately. Mm. It still looks just as red and just as scary. <laughs> and oily. And oily, yes. Unlike other mala hot pot places, okay. the mala broth at Tongsing Rui already comes brimming with ingredients like kojak and Sichuan pickled vegetables. Shall we? We shall. And the soup's thicker. Oh wow. Actually, not even that spicy. Mm. Right? It's definitely more flavorful. I think overall, this broth is not as oily. This meal sent us back a whopping 55 <laughs> Singapore dollars each. That's over twice our last budget mala hot pot meal. Wow. Oh, those were two good meals, Oof. you know. But if you had to pick, which do you think is more worth it? Well, I would have to say Tongsing Rui. The broth is very flavorful, mm. and if I'm gonna put any calories in my mouth, it's gonna be that one. Okay, I'm gonna pick Shili Fang. Mala, after a while, I actually can't tell what I'm eating. So if I didn't know which restaurant we were in, I think it would pretty much taste the same to me. So I enjoyed my mala meal. I mean, I, I can still feel the strong flavours, you know, lingering on, but I noticed the numbing effect went away quite quickly. Uh, but that burn in my tummy, yeah, I can still feel it. That's no surprise, because the broths were packed full of spices. 
which are purportedly full of health benefits. Sichuan peppers are actually dried berries. They are said to be able to stimulate our immune systems, help reduce body pain, boost appetite and improve metabolism, lower blood pressure, strengthen bones and reduce inflammation. You might be more familiar with dried chilli. They have good minerals like folate, potassium and thymine and are excellent sources of vitamin A, B, C and E. But here's what got me excited. Capsaicin, the chemical that gives dried chilli their heat, is said to help with weight loss. So that is good news for me because I've been trying to lose a bunch of weight these past few months. And now that I know dried chilli can help me do that, I've decided to load on all the ingredients, load on the chilli, even ask for a spicier sauce too. What do you have there, Steve? Hmm, I wouldn't have that if I were you. Oh, why not? Well, let me get my food and then we'll talk. Okay. This is Heart Doctor, Dr. Kelvin Chin. I want to know why he is cautioning me against this dish that seems to offer a myriad of health benefits. The amount of weight that you lose from chilli is actually very, very modest. You're talking about one kilogram over three or four months of just pure eating chilli really? alone. Okay. So unless I eat a whole, whole lot of chilli, yep. not much is going to happen to me. The problem is once your tolerance of chilli build up over time, the effects of losing weight from chilli actually gets lower and it reduces over time as well. Okay. What about the Sichuan peppercorns? I know that's also a main ingredient in this and that there are certain health benefits to it? Yeah, you're, you're talking about very, very modest benefits with uh, probably a large amount of peppercorns, which is not very palatable in, in, for a lot of people. You're also talking about the oil and the salt and the content in the mala that's really unhealthy. You know, it increases your risk of getting uh, heart disease. So actually, how much mala should I be eating if I want to achieve the good but not the bad effects? That will probably be not more than once a month. Once a month might be barely enough to satisfy mala lovers. But for just this bowl alone, how much sodium and fat am I actually taking in? The lab test results are in. I tested Singapore's top three stir-fry mala and mala hotpot and averaged out the numbers. To put things into perspective, I'm comparing them to other dishes that we are familiar with. On average, that's 469 milligrams of sodium per 100 grams of stir-fry mala and 418 milligrams per 100 grams for mala hot pot. That's higher than the milligrams of sodium per 100 grams for most of our popular hawker dishes, like mutton biryani, laksa and char kway teow. Hello. I'm bringing in an expert to help me make sense of the data. This is 100 grams of okay. your mala broth. Okay, inside actually is contained about 418 milligrams of sodium. So don't forget you have other ingredients like okay. meat, okay. processed food. And sometimes you will not drink one, you may drink two or three. Your graph should be exceeded the scale. You can easily hit about 1000 and sometimes more than 1005 of sodium. Oh wow. When it comes to saturated fats, about 45% of the total fats in stir-fried mala and 34% of the oil layer in mala hot pot is all unhealthy saturated fats. That's comparable to the percentage of saturated fats in most of the hawker dishes. On the recommended calorie intakes, we have about 25 to 30% of our energy shall come from the fat, which is about 55 grams to 80 grams of fat that we're supposed to take in daily. Okay. And one third of it is saturated fat. So if you consider one third, which means you cannot exceed about 22 grams of saturated fat yeah. per day. Per day, and yes. already this alone is, is five. Yes, this alone is five. Don't forget that this is just the soup. With all the ingredients, easily you will get more than 20. That's not all. 
the act of boiling the mala soup itself makes it even more unhealthy. During the high heat process or prolonged heating, like the mala hot pot, this polyunsaturated or unsaturated fat can be converted into trans fatty acid as well as saturated fatty acids, which makes your dishes quite dangerous in this case. Okay, so the longer I cook it, the, the good fat which I kind of need becomes bad fat. Yes, because they will undergo quite a number of chemical reactions. They will produce other toxic chemicals as well as free radicals that will attack your body. The higher the temperature, the faster the reaction rate. I also tested to see if the spice level affects the sodium and fat levels. And here's what I found. For stir-fried mala with less spice, we found 380 milligrams of sodium and 3.4 grams of saturated fats per 100 grams. The one with extra spice had sodium levels that shot up to 519 milligrams and 6.3 grams of saturated fats. If you want extra spicy, they will add more oil. And with more oil comes more yes, fat. Yes, more oil means more fat. You have more saturated and more trans fat. To think that a single portion of our favourite mala dishes could lead to a drastic spike in our sodium and saturated fat levels. But soon, I'll discover something about mala that's even more frightening. Hey, welcome back guys. If you've been watching the show for the past like 20 minutes, I'm thinking you might be feeling a bit hungry for a snack. Well, how about a mala fissant snack just for you? Three years ago, a mala invasion fired up our snack game. Snacks unhealthy, we all know that. But do you know how your favourite mala snacks compare with other popular snacks? 100 grams of chips, peanuts and fish skin amount to this much. Mala flavoured chips are saltier and more fatty than the original ones. But they aren't as bad as salted egg yolk chips. For peanuts, salted egg yolk and mala peanuts have a lot more sodium than the original ones. But mala peanuts have the lowest saturated fat levels among the three. And finally, the irresistible fish skin. Both mala and original versions are saltier and more fatty than the salted egg yolk version. But what is frightening to me is the amount of sodium in mala fish skin. Over 1000 milligrams per 100 grams! That's over half our recommended daily sodium intake. And at 22.4 grams of saturated fat, it's over the recommended saturated fat intake for the entire day. That is bad news for mala fanatics. Too much of these might spell trouble for their health. So I want to know if they are able to give up or at least cut down on their favourite mala dishes. I've invited three Singaporeans who are crazy over this bowl and spicy flavour. Adinda Safira Adani, Crystal Chin and Danny Dawood. This is a typical portion. In a portion like this, there is over 400 milligrams of sodium in it. Oh wow, I usually eat like four times a piece. I didn't expect like that small bowl to have so much sodium. Would you believe me if I told you the amount of saturated fat in these mala dishes is actually more than some of our favourite hawker food like uh, mutton, biryani? Uh, no, <laughs> I thought biryani is quite fatty already. It makes me feel concerned because I eat this much more than biryani of course. <laughs> yeah. Knowing what you know now, would you give up mala? Give up? No. No? That would be the last thing on my mind. That's a hard negotiation, but maybe 
Um, not as often, maybe like once every two months. We can't be 24 7 healthy. Otherwise, like what's the point in living if you don't get to enjoy your favourite food? If cutting down on mala is going to be next to impossible for amala lovers, surely there are healthier ways to eat it. I've asked dietitian Jacqueline Lowe to join our feast and share some tips. Usually I let the ingredients sit in it for a while, let it boil up and then let the flavour sort of infuse and then I would ask them to remove that oil. Sometimes it can fill up even three to four of these uh, rice bowls. Just the oil? Just the oil. Oh my gosh. So the ingredients wise, anything that has been deep fried beforehand is going to absorb double the amount of oil. Oh! <laughs> so you can see those little bubbles inside yeah. the tofu skin. That's going to really soak up all that oil. So something like deep fried yam is going to be already double the calories of a normal yam. But once you put it into that soup, it's going to be triple the calories. Oh no. <laughs> Yikes. If I'm going to eat vegetable in my mala, which vegetable should I choose so that it doesn't absorb that much oil? Things like the lettuce or spinach, you know, you can just blanch the vegetables, take it out and then eat it straight away as opposed to leaving it in the hot pot to actually cook fully and absorb all that oil. And what about stir-fried mala? Do the same rules apply? I think it's a similar concept. Maybe aim for seven items and choose at least four items that are pretty healthy. You can actually ask them to put less of that paste. Mm. Yeah, mm. so that's another way to reduce that amount of sodium as well. Yeah, some places you can ask for less oil as well. Mm, right? Yeah. And snacks. Now we've heard of mala snacks. Yeah. Is there a healthy way around that too? Give yourself like a small bowl. Usually about a quarter of the bag is about 150 calories, which is perfect for a snack. Yeah. That's very little though. I know very it's little. small. It's small. <laughs> You're not getting any sort of nutrition in that. So after weeks of filming and eating mala, I have to say, the flavour and the fragrance of it has begun to grow on me. And I think I can begin to understand why people are just so crazy over the spicy seasoning. But after learning how easily our sodium and saturated fat intake can spike with just one serving of our favourite mala dishes, I'll be more selective on how often I eat it and the stuff that goes into my mala dish.